Okay, let's now move ahead with our first discussion session. Rural Futures, Integrating Conservation and Livelihoods. The objective of the session is to focus on the integration of conservation efforts, employment, generation, and promoting alternative livelihoods. May I call upon stage the chairs for the session, Dr. Jian Shu Shu from the Kunming Institute of Botany, and Dr. Sarla Kaling from ATRI. Dr. Jian Shu Shu is a professor at the Kunming Institute of Botany, Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's a doctorate in social sciences and a leading ethno-ecologist on interdisciplinary research studies that involve coupled human and environmental systems. His current work includes the investigation of early warning signals for global climate change, trans transboundary water governance issues, landscape restoration, ecosystem services, and enhancement of their resilience, agriculture, and integrative conservation. Professor Shu has uh, published over 100 papers in high-impact journals, including Nature, Science, PNAS, Conservation Biology, Fungal Diversity, and Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. Dr. Sarla Kaling is um, the regional director of ATRI, that is the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, Eastern Himalayan Northeast India office. She has more than 15 years of experience in the multi-dimensional fields of ecology, Himalayan biodiversity, and the impact of human interactions on ecology and biodiversity. Additionally, her work also involves management of large field projects on conservation and livelihoods, monitoring and evaluation. Prior to joining ATRI, she worked for the WWF, specifically the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund Eastern Himalaya Biodiversity Hotspot Program. May I now invite both the chairs to begin the session and take the dialogue forward. Thank you. Hey Fairly nice to be here once aware to get a refreshment uh, by inviting uh, Regent and uh, my good friend from India. And also to know new face, new friends, and the connect people, and also to learn a little bit more about also Assam. So uh, our session, and uh, we talk about the uh, Lolo's future, integration, conservation, and livelihoods. First, I'd like to dis uh, say little things about rural future. I think our human come long way from start from Africa into Asia and spread all over the world. Now we have a new word called Anthropocene. Basically the human are dominant all our systems. And from nature, there's no such nature at all. And uh, what you mentioned but in Plato we have railway, highway, the load connection everywhere, and you can easily cross to conquer the, the mountain Everest if you're willing to pay more, and you can have easy access. And also, I think in the future, we're living in big uncertainty. In China, I think also part of the US, other part of the world talk about artificial intelligence. And what's mean, now we look at the Chinese online selling a one in artificial intelligence can supply the one billion pro products per day can deliver all over the world. So who's going to do job? What's our job for our future, for our kids? So it's, we're living in uncertainty. So we come a long way, but we don't know next 10 years what we're going to do, how we're going to manage nature, how we're going to create a new economy, so that's our, why we're sitting here. So our future economy basically building upon the natural assets and also our long culture from this region. Yes, we talk about solo thousands of years old. So that's we're talking about the rural future. It's really a timingly and the discussion this topic. So my understanding rural future start with the integration of our knowledge system, exchange of a culture, also 
to learning what's future economy through the integration of nature and the culture. The second very important uh, failure, everything we talk about the innovation, I think uh, the morning session we started with the innovation, how we keep our old generation, also very important young generation, or leadership to put innovation. So how to make products made in China, made in India works for all over the world, but all for local community. So that's about the innovation. Finally, also very important, safety. the investment. Investment social capital, invest financial investment uh, for our next generation education was very important. So I think uh, our session about the really not only about the integration, but also about the innovation and the investment in social capital also the financial sector. And uh, I'd like to say also the so rule of future, one from human perspective about access to natural resources, fresh air, drinking water, so about access. The so second also about ability, ability to innovate, ability to benefit, ability, ability to communicate, interact with others are very important about the rule of future. And finally, this session also we talk about social economic equity. So equity is about feeling, feeling you're part of this process, you're part of gain. And uh, our China we just finished our uh, 19 community parties leader uh, the conference, and uh, our party leader Xi Jinping was said he said make, making people have a sense of a gain. Because China we already have rapid development for decades, but not everyone have the same feeling. Different between the mountain people are have they think about them marginalized and then they lose it. So have, having people have a sense of a gain are very important during the whole development, doesn't matter the conservation and the rural development. So I'd like to stop here. And I'd like to uh, introduce my session, and uh, together with my, my co-chair, uh, start, uh, we start in uh, some background introduction about session, and we have four speed talk. And uh, I'd really like to invite our speed talker and the limit within five minutes, because we have delayed program, and now we have uh, a very intense agenda. And then we try to have 20 minutes for conversation with we have six uh, discussion and the uh, chair by, uh, uh, facilitated by Salalayan and Kali and uh, with my co-chair. And finally, we try to lock up within our time frame. So without further delay, I'd like to invite my co-chair to discuss the content specific for East Himalaya. Good morning. Uh, really happy to be here for the Naturenomics Forum again. Uh, as we discuss uh, one of the most important, but again widely discussed uh, theme, uh, integrating conservation and livelihoods. Uh, if we speak from an Eastern Himalaya perspective, Northeast India, including Assam and the hills of North Bengal, uh, I think it's inextricably linked, and all of you will agree with me that both development and conservation is linked. Uh, but if you've noticed over the years, we've seen a lot of rapid changes that have happened, which is both affecting our livelihoods and the environment. And we know that poverty is still high in the mountains, in the Northeast. And reducing poverty has been one of the uh, uh, focus and one of the priorities of the government. But at the same time, we have to also uh, recognize the fact that the environment has to be protected, conservation has to go on. And this is what the theme uh, of the session is going to be today with speed talks and from some discussions with our uh, panelists and experts in this theme. Um, being sensitive to time, and as we always are already behind time, I would like to now uh, call upon the speed talk uh, 
participants for this session. Um, and they are um, Mr. Pasang Lepcha from Atri, and who will, I think, make the first presentation. Darjeeling, Ashoka Trust Darjeeling. Uh, my presentation uh, focuses on the uh, Darjeeling Himalayas, uh, so which comprises of the three hill subdivisions, Koshim, Kalimpung, and Darjeeling. We also have a huge plain area, that is the Tarai, which is part of also part of the Darjeeling district. But this presentation focuses specifically on the Darjeeling hill areas. So uh, Darjeeling, uh, which is known as the Queen of the Hills, is uh, famous for its uh, tea, tourism, and timber. Uh, this has been known as the three trees since the since it was established by the british and uh, so uh, that is how this sector evolved and uh, was started by the british uh, uh, land was cleared for setting up plantations uh, extraction of timber and also like uh, to export the timber the darjeeling railways was established which is now known as the toy train and uh, people from all over the world come here to enjoy the toy train and its scenic beauty. But uh, is this the true uh, you know, picture, picture that is presented whenever people visit the area or people talk, talk about the area? And this is what the presentation tries to do. Uh, so tea, like uh, the myth behind tea is that it is known as the champagne of the East and uh, uh, like uh, everybody thinks that Darjeeling, tea, in fact, today in the morning, someone was asking me if I drink Darjeeling tea. You know? So in fact, people of Darjeeling don't actually drink Darjeeling tea because all of it is exported and it is rather very expensive. But as you can see that uh, like it employs only a few small section of the people, you know, like only uh, 52,000 people, you know, in, in over 85 tea gardens. And, and, and that is quite uh, small compared compared to the po population, total population. And uh, the problem also is that the tea industry as such has not grown with the population since it has been established by the British. You know? and, and, and the question of the sustainability of uh, Darjeeling tea you know, still remains. Uh, remains. And, and uh, also there is a lot of uh, seasonal um, employment which is resulting in a high out migration from the rural areas. Tourism like uh, if, uh, if you look at tourism, you know, like people from all over the world come here to visit the Darjeeling, Darjeeling Hills, you know. Uh, but the, the problem with tourism is that it it gives benefits to only the urban areas of Darjeeling, whereas 65% of Darjeeling is rural, and 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 uh, it, the economic benefits are restricted only to the urban areas. Uh, also, like the concerns of the environment, especially the the tremendous. Uh, 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 resource uh, use in terms of water. We, we are known for the water scarcity. Darjeeling Hills is known for the water scarcity. Use of energy, waste management. We do not have a waste management uh, system in Darjeeling Hills. Although there has been a huge hype about the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, there, the waste management system is nil in Darjeeling. And of course, the vehicular pollution is never taken into account. So that that is there. You know? so so uh, with regard to timber, like the sustainability of timber is uh, always, a, there's always a looming question mark. The forest is controlled by the forest department. And Kalimpung subdivision, which used to be the highest revenue earning, is not so anymore because of the political climate and so on. So this now slide presents the overall picture of what uh, Atri is doing in the Eastern Himalayas, specifically in the Singhal National Park and the Sinchal Wildlife Sanctuary. We are working in 30 villages, uh, forest villages and peripheral villages. And uh, so the, 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 the attempt here is to shift the le lens of development into the rural areas, the inner hearts of Darjeeling, which people don't see. And so like, uh, our, our intervention focuses on you know, resilient livelihoods, and uh, which has key components like climate smart agriculture, uh, like improving livelihoods through alternative livelihoods like apiary, polyhouses, and also uh, there's a huge component of human wildlife conflict. So uh, these are the major outcomes that is presented here, and uh, like some of them are like uh, improvement in agriculture uh, production. Uh, 
we have been able to set up community-based tourism, which looks into issues of equity, concerns of the environment in two villages. And we also have been able to pilot mitigation activities in two villages. A detailed uh, pres poster presentation of the human wildlife conflict will be presented by Ms. Poonam Rai, our colleague from ATRI. And uh, the next presenter, Chiring, will also present an in-depth presentation about the climate smart agriculture. And, and, and also, like, uh, over the years, like, our, like, what ITRI is trying to do, you know, through our project Forest for Human Wellbeing is, uh, like, we are looking at reduction in carbon, uh, uh, carbon emissions, sequestration, you know, and also, like, uh, increase the number of people's awareness on climate change and mitigation. We are working with uh, institutions to discuss and talk about climate change mitigation. And also, like adoption of uh, adoption of sustainable agriculture practices and use of ecosystem services. So, thank you. Doji Budia. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Chiring Doji Budia from Atri Darjeeling. So today, I am going to uh, deliver my talk on agriculture in Darjeeling Himalayas. Darjeeling Himalayas stand out to the world for tea and tourism. However, very few are aware of the tradition of farming in Darjeeling Hills. About 61% of the people living in Darjeeling Hills are directly dependent on agriculture as their primary source of livelihood. In Darjeeling, people practice, people practice uh, integrated farming system, that is uh, whole management of farm. This system gears towards the conservation of environment, and aims to achieve profits uh, with sustained production level. This system involves uh, cultivation, production, animal husbandry, and agroforestry. However, however the ongoing change in climatic conditions uh, has had an adverse effect on the weather patterns that has affected precipitation in the region. Changes in the precipitation like uh, unseasonal and excessive rainfall and sometimes extreme dry spills affects agriculture drastically. Several factors like rainwater, unseasonal wind and excessive tillage, etc., cause soil erosion, resulting in a loss of fertile soil, thus leading to poor yield. Apart from these uh, ongoing changes in climatic condition and soil erosion, Crop, a significant crop loss is also observed in these areas due to rampant human wildlife conflict. Okay, now, so what we did and where? Uh, to improve agricultural productivity through sustainable farming practices, uh, we promote climate smart agriculture in 10 villages of two protected areas, Sinchal Wildlife Sanctuary and Singalila National Park in Darjeeling, Himalayas. The four major components uh, are basically uh, implemented in the villages to promote climate smart agriculture. That's our terrace management, biocomposting, soil enrichment, and pest management. So as, uh, as it was already mentioned in the earlier slide that the soil erosion is a common issue in the region. Uh, so terrace management practices has been implemented in the field uh, to reduce the slope of the there is to prevent the soil erosion. Similarly, to improve soil health and to uh, reduce the residue of inorganic fertilizers, uh, biocomposting like vermicompost uh, and soil enrichment are also, also implemented. To prevent inorganic residue of chemical pesticides and insecticides, we also promote uh, pest management through locally made pesticides with the help of locally available Pest deterrent plants like Artemisia, Eupatorium, Mint, etc. Okay, the results. So far, uh, through this uh, intervention, we have 64% households uh, adopted climate smart agriculture in 10 villages. Uh, there has been, uh, uh, through this intervention, there has been a reduction in the usage of chemical fertilizer by 50 to 66% in the four villages. Similarly, there is reduction in burning of agriculture residues and release of carbon dioxide in 1.4 hectares of land 
and has been reduction in large uh, in the uses of chemical insecticides and fertilizer uh, fertilizer in 86 percent households in the 10 villages so post intervention since 2015 uh, there has been improvement in average uh, productivity of agriculture crops uh, in four villages like okay uh, improvement in uh, productivity of crops like potato potato by 8.45 uh, percent uh, similarly there uh, there has been increase improvement in other crops like pea cabbage and radish etc Okay, so way forward. Uh, there, uh, there is uh, no, uh, actually the food scarcity was not uh, the issues even in the last shutdown in the hills. Uh, the uh, 105, uh, 105 days of strike showcase that we have a surplus uh, amount of food supply. Therefore, it is very important for us to think about the sustain and production of agriculture to link with the local market. And the second thing regarding uh, crop depredation by wildlife, uh, human wildlife conflict, uh, we need to address these issues uh, with convergence uh, through the uh, convergence. Uh, it should be uh, region specific policies needs to be developed. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, may I invite the third speaker, Lobin Easterman from Palipala Foundation to talk about the integrated landscape. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> Time up? <laughs> uh, you know, usually when you go to conferences like this, there's always a talk about, you know, alternate livelihoods. The objective is always to, you know, reduce dependency of forest communities on, on the forest. They're usually designed uh, to substitute one set of activity that causes harm to forest with another that will uh, hopefully cause less harm. Uh, I would look at alternative livelihoods and the way conservation organizations use that. Uh, it is used mostly as a negotiating tool. You're taking an idea that you think might work in, in any given community, and uh, you're using that as a negotiating tool for community participation. Uh, but how is this, has this tool changed over the last decade or so? I think that is something that uh, you know, is very less discussed in con conferences. Because we seem to be talking about the same ideas that we you know, started talking about a decade back. We are always about, you know, let's, let's do some piggery farm, let's do some duckery farm, let's do some, you know, agriculture. Uh, let's start some small homestays here and there, you know, to get the community involved, you know, take ownership of, of, of conservation issues. I think, I think there, is a, there is a proper need uh, for all of us uh, to actually realign how we think about alternate livelihoods. Uh, because uh, since we started talking about alternate livelihoods and, uh, and today, there's a, lot, there's a lot that has changed even in rural landscapes. You know, we've got the internet coming in. Penetration has been, uh, you know, in rural areas as well. Uh, smartphones have become cheaper. Facebook is always, uh, is almost everywhere. Uh, over the last one year, I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to spend a lot of time with forest fringe communities in Udalguri, right on the Bhutan border. Uh, many young people there still use uh, Facebook as their news, you know, channel. So do many of us in, in the room, I think. Uh, content might differ, but the medium of of how we take information, I think remains the same. Ranjit was talking about the de de democratization of uh, information. I think that is also a term that is often spoken about in a lot of conferences, and it is, token, it is spoken about in context mainly to you know, urban landscapes. But how does this democratization of information actually impact uh, rural landscapes, and how do we think about uh, alternate livelihoods under, under these scenarios? So if you're looking, uh, you know, in the future, I think uh, alternate livelihoods cannot just be limited. Conservation organizations cannot look at alternate livelihoods as the only negotiating tool. I think, you know, uh, we are now dealing with communities that are much more empowered. Uh, they have much more information at their fingertips. So the way we talk about alternate livelihoods, it cannot just be fisheries. It cannot be, you know, uh, piggeries and duckeries and, and so on and so forth. I think we have to match, uh, you know, aspirations. Uh, uh, there is also a lot of research that's been put in, and uh, the information is that there is a lot of aspirations even in rural areas. People don't want to do, you know, the traditional uh, modes of alternate livelihood. Most people want to move into cities. Most people look for a better life. Aspirations are almost similar to the aspirations that all of us share, you know, in, in different mediums. 
So I, I think you know throughout this session, I think if you could just uh, discuss a little bit about how we need to change the facet of how we talk about uh, alternate livelihoods in, in the changing scenario of empowerment of information, democratization of information, and also rising aspirations. So that was a speed talk. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And finally, we have a speed talk last one and from Bhutan and Jimmy Doji from the Loyal Minas National Park of Bhutan. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jigmi Dorji. I'll be presenting a very short talk uh, in, uh, in the perspectives of Royal Manas National Park. Uh, over the past year, we have been implementing so many integrated conservations, and almost all the time we have been, uh, you know, failure uh, rating on our own. And then most of the time, the activities have been uh, project bound, uh, the money matter, and all this. And then today, I'm going to present a story, a very short uh, story, how we have been able to go beyond project time and then money. OK, just to get you familiarized with Royal Manas, because I'm talking about the Royal Manas National Park. We are one of the national parks in Bhutan, very close to Manas National Park in India. And then we are right into a bigger landscape, which is called Tang's Boundary Manas Conservation Area. And Balipara Foundation, we are trying to fill into this Tang's Boundary Manas, uh, I think, since last year. So I would like to uh, you know, take you through a story in this landscape. OK, this is a story about a crop insurance scheme, very s small scale that we have initiated in Bhutan. And then all these green patches on the map, we initiated for different communities, uh, but only at the, the left corner of my side, there is a village called Tadritang. We have been very successful in taking forward this initiative. And for this, the design we have used for this crop insurance scheme is this one. The, the Royal Manas National Park, we raised a fund. We collaborated with the beneficiaries, uh, which is a community, uh, Tadritang community, then uh, the agreement was very simple. They are supposed to support us in the conservation initiatives. Uh, that is very, very uh, at the service level. Then we gave them a grant money of uh, uh, new 5,000, which is equal to rupees 5,000. Then uh, we developed a mechanism where they would deposit 70% of the 5,000 in the fixed deposit then 30% of it as a saving uh, deposit. Then within that uh, uh, saving deposit, uh, they will also uh, have a premium deposited. And then every year, they assess the, the crop uh, uh, damage, and then they compensate from that money. And then this has been very successful. Actual communities are taking beyond the project time, and now they are being very successful. This is a story about uh, elephant-friendly village. We supported uh, this uh, particular communities who, who has uh, uh, 48 households of people living there. Actually, they were mostly living very temporarily. And then we supported uh, electric fencing in 2015. They have been very comfortable in saving their crops, uh, uh, securing their own lives. Then now they started uh, you know, thinking beyond the, the interventions. They, they are now uh, interested in providing homes for elephants. They are looking forward to uh, plant uh, fodders. They are creating uh, water holes. They are creating sod leaks. So this kind of initiatives uh, they are bringing. And then uh, I have a lot of stories, but uh, just, uh, just to keep that. And this is the lessons uh, we are able to learn from these two initiatives. You know, uh, that. Uh, People's acceptance of gambling as a social uh, uh, problem, then it's becoming more successful. Gambling or issues beyond social costs. If they are not able to bear the costs, the projects are becoming more successful. The need base is another area where their acceptance is very high. Community empowerment and capacity building also helps us with the success. The cost sharing is very much uh, part of this success. Then. Constant motivation and support also required for any project, livelihood project to be successful. And uh, finally, a small and homogeneous community, these are actually successful. 
Thank you so much. Uh, to go on to the panel discussions in conversation with, I would like to now invite the panelists for this session. I would like to invite Mr. Scott McMahon, the Atlanta Botanical Garden. I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Belinda Wright from the Wildlife Protection Society of India, Dr. Sharmishta Das, Tezpur University, Dr. Peter E. Mortimer, Kunming Institute of Botany, Mr. Shankar Venkateshwaran, Dhurba Das from Mask India, and Mansi Parikh from the Balipara Foundation. Uh, so Dr. Scott McMahon works with the Atalanta Botanical Garden, and he oversees plant collection and uh, has create and is created a visiting scholar program to promote the exchange of knowledge of plants with other botanical institutes of the world. Uh, Ms. Uh, Belinda Wright, as we know, works with the Wildlife Protection Society of India and has worked in a lot of uh, wildlife trade uh, related issues and wildlife conservation issues. Dr. <coughs> Sharmishta Das, who works with the uh, Tezpur University uh, Department of Sociology, has worked on the issues of agrarian relations, livelihoods in Assam, and her area of interest includes gender commons and the rural economy. Over the years, she has published in the area of gender kinship, rural agrarian economy, and livelihoods. Uh, Dr. P. Mortimer is an associate professor at the Kunming Institute of Botany, and he specializes in soil ecology, and more specifically in fungal ecology. Uh, uh, Mr. Shankar Venkateshwaran has been the chief of Tata Sustainability Group at Tata Sons Limited since 2014. He's responsible for guiding the Tata Sons Group on sustainability and corporate responsibility initiatives. And he served with the audit and consulting firm Pricewaterhouse, uh, India as the Director of Sustainability. Mr. Venkateshwaran has 31 years of experience in working in the corporate and development. Uh, Mansi Parikh works uh, with the business team to design uh, business plans and build partnerships. She comes from the Balipara Foundation, and she adds her expertise in marketing, entrepreneurship, and business model design to the team. She's passionate about development, and she hopes to add a human-centered design perspective to the organization's business model. Uh, Mr. Thurba Das uh, works with Mask India. It's a, a community-based, field-based organizations working on livelihoods and development. Uh, because uh, we really have a short time, and let's cut, deliberately cut into topics. So the basically, uh, our panel discussion is mainly a discussion how to, in, uh, what we try to integrate, how to do innovation, and what kind of innovation, how to invest, and there's a financially, and there's a human capital, and others. So, uh, and uh, how to particularly link with the local livelihoods and the conservation f perspective. So we, very good, nicely, we are trying to cover different field and uh, from your own perspective, can share something who like to first. Yeah. Um, this works. Yeah, yeah, it works. Well, I think, okay. Yeah. Um, I think one of the most important things and, and um, that, that have come out of what I've learned after many years of working on conflict issues and livelihood issues is that you need first to plan. You need first to be, to, to be humble and forget about everything that you know and go and sit with the communities where you plan to do your work. 
listen to them very carefully and, and eat with them, sleep in their houses, spend some time, and then plan your model. And I really, really urge you to do that. I, I, I bump into too many projects where somebody's got what they think is a brilliant idea, but it may not be the most effective thing to, to do there. Um, and the second thing is, things must be geared towards employment. I mean, you could, you could call it whatever you like, um, sustainable livelihood and, and so on. But people need to get, um, if you want to do effective conservation, somebody needs to have a, what's the word, you know, a, there should be a benefit in it for people. It, it, it won't just be, um, it just, it, you know, anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, Sharmishta, uh, uh, with your uh, lot of work on gender and the agrarian uh, issues that you've been working with, uh, it would be nice to know, you know, what we face in a lot of these livelihoods and development issues is a lot of out-migration because of the, what Robin talked about, the alternative uh, ways of carrying out your livelihoods, or even the stress and the push factors that exist in our rural areas. So in a situation where we, the kind of rural futures we want for our people, our communities over here, what do you think is, uh, what are the th ways in which some of these push factors uh, that a lot of our young people get caught into could be, you know, channelized into something which is more positive for their own livelihoods? Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a very pertinent issue in, uh, the rural landscapes of Assam, not only in Assam, but all over Northeast, it's a common phenomenon that the youth is moving out. So where is the problem? Why are we facing this crisis that youth is constantly moving out of the villages? And of late, this was a phenomenon which started some 10, 15 years back, but today what we see is a reverse migration. These youths are coming back because they were primarily engaged in the informal sector of the economy. They were not engaged in the formal sector. And uh, what we need to do probably is to uh, look at the issues which are specific to the regions. Uh, in the sense, we have to look at local specificities of the people, what are the issues with which people are struggling, what are the reasons why people are moving out. Probably if we can do that, if we can, as uh, she has already pointed out, that we have to sit with people and we have to know from them what are their problems, what are their issues, and uh, that is one way through which we can uh, uh, look for a good rural future. For instance, I'll just quickly give you an example from the field that I worked on. There, a lot of people are moving out of the village primarily because there is no hope in agriculture. And if we look at the villages which are in and around our uh, national reserves and the forest, forest basically, are uh, the dwellers are basically peasants. So their main mode of production is agriculture. And we are seeing that there is a big failure in agriculture, not only in terms of disinterest, but also because of the issues of landlessness. And this landlessness is also because of the environmental degradation. So there is like, it's a vicious cycle. And the only way forward which I feel is to consider the local specificities, historicize, know from them what are their problems, what are their issues, and probably then we can go for an alternative livelihood. Even I think Belinda mentioned, and now that you are mentioning, like, you know, let conservation or let the livelihoods themselves be an agenda of the local people. Absolutely. But um, the theme as it stands today is like uh, integrating conservation and environmental protection with livelihoods. Uh, many times, uh, those of us who have worked in the field also get into that thing of saying that, okay, these are agendas of the elite, you know, yeah. to conserve for who? Environment protection, you know, who benefits? So I would like to ask, uh, any one of you can answer this. So uh, what is it that nature-based economy, you think, will bring where, in terms of social equity, where we think that everything else has failed? Because in a world of development, like we are saying, is like you know, there's no equity, there's still rural poverty, despite so much of government uh, interventions. And then we are coming with this new paradigm saying that there is this thing called nature-based economy, and as we can see in nature-nomics. 
So I would like to hear from any one of you about, uh, you know, will this really bring about the social equity that we are talking about and what the theme is about today? I, I could comment on that. Um, I think one of the reasons we haven't seen a larger success in these initiatives is we need approaches that are more comprehensive. We don't need to only understand context-specific problems, but we also need to look at the endpoints of, of the initiatives that we start. How do those rural-based communities access markets? How do they develop a product that the person down the road will actually know about? So starting the initiatives, giving training, uh, doing product development is one aspect, but also accessing the markets, selling those products, teaching these communities how to do marketing, how to, to actually sell is, is, a huge, is a huge problem. We faced this with some projects which meet all of the criteria that we've been discussing in Myanmar. But these, these guys ended up with products that just sat in the village because the downstream aspects were not there. Uh, may I just come in on that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, a, a disclaimer, I'm completely new to cons conservation. Uh, but I am uh, familiar in my work with NGOs with the livelihood space. And I can't help thinking that they seem to be two worlds that should be living together but actually live apart. Uh, so some of the stuff that were presented in the speed talks is, is uh, something that organizations that work on livelihoods work on intuitively, instinctively, and for a long time. Uh, so being Putting people at the center is the starting point for any livelihoods uh, organization. Uh, on the other hand, when livelihoods organizations plan their interventions, I don't think they even understand what are the positive or negative impacts that they have on the environment. So, uh, and that's where uh, conservation uh, organizations are, 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 are coming. So I just can't uh, help feeling that uh, we need to find ways for far greater collaborations between organizations that work on, uh, on livelihoods and have been working on livelihoods for decades and the cons conservation organizations and find that sweet spot because they actually need to work together. Uh, I mean, for example, if you look at rules of thumb for what a livelihoods organization does uh, when it plans a livelihood uh, any livelihood intervention, you, they, they, it's a, it's a, you know, we look at it as a three-legged stool. They need to be, when you're producing anything, you need to have at least two or three legs in a stool available. You need to have raw material available in that place. You need to have uh, skills available. And you need to have a market available. Ideally, if all these three are available, you have a successful livelihood intervention. But if you only have one, you wonder about it. And you know, to your point about markets, that you will end up producing a lot of stuff which, for which there is no market. So, so all I'm suggesting is that that collaboration is very critical. And we also need to understand the continuum that we are in, on the one hand, of saying livelihoods uh, needs to, uh, and communities are at different stages, I, I suspect, in that continuum, between saying, let's not, uh, I mean, we need to find alternatives for them to exploit the environment in terms of livelihoods, but move them towards a place where it is in their huge interest to actually conserve. Till you move that, uh, till you move the whole narrative to saying it is in our interest, it is in our financial interest, our social interest, and so on, to conserve, you always are going to have this tension uh, between these two. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just build on that. Uh, I, th I think, you know, uh, Shankar and uh, Belinda both spoke about, uh, you know, understanding what the communities want and also making sure that the other measures or the other conditions for success are met. Uh, there's also another thing is that uh, we tend to set ourselves and, you know, us included at Bali Fire Foundation, we tend to set ourselves very lofty goals. We forget about the small wins. If we can create small wins, throughout the project, you get more community buy-in, and that creates more uh, conditions for success of these projects. Because then you're not only leaving behind the fact that 
Uh, and this is something you know we saw in the video that sort of screened in his talk, which says you know about constant prototyping. So you keep testing the smaller things. Uh, you may fail at some, but you will see a lot of small successes. And that's how you actually build a more successful long-term intervention, in my opinion. And that's something that sometimes we get so focused on the larger picture that we forget to build in those small goals uh, that we should hit along the way as well. Uh, I, would, I would agree with the other panelists that have spoken and say that really practicality is key, I think. Uh, educating um, the local people on how to propagate uh, unusual plants or medicinal plants, <laughs> working with local ethnobotanists. You know, I think the speed talks really showed us that small projects, hands-on projects, uh, are the most beneficial to these areas. Uh, you have to begin at the beginning. You can't assume that uh, the, the villagers really know the value of the plants that are there. I think education and cheap uh, practical solutions, uh, which, which uh, include what all of the ideas of the panelists have said, uh, is just hands-on small group projects uh, to help train um, these, these areas as to you know, the value of, these, of the plants. And then to show them that the money that is generated from these, these plants can, can stay in the area rather than being, you know, by cutting large pieces of timber down, uh, other areas benefit really more than, the, than the, the money does not stay locally. It goes out uh, to other areas. So it's very important not only to keep some of the value of what is there, but also how to reinvest in the area uh, and to educate uh, the young people that are coming along. Uh, would Durba want to say anything? If not, actually I have a question which is actually targeted at his experience of work with uh, community-based organizations and farmers group and SHGs. So especially in the Northeast or in India, we have a lot of these uh, government-sponsored uh, flagship programs, and especially they're supposed to be you know, enhancing rural livelihoods, and they are really huge, large programs. Probably some of these programs are some of the largest development programs in the world. So Durba, you have so much of experience of working with SAGs and farmers group, and many times, uh, uh, we see, and those of us who have worked in the, uh, in the rural areas have seen that many of these programs are not meeting the results or getting the impacts for which they were set up for. So I would like to know more about uh, your experience and your opinion about this, uh, especially because there is so much an NGO or a, a group can do, because unless there is government mainstreaming, or making use of whatever flag, or we mainstream with the flagship programs, uh, our scale is going to be very small and the impact's also going to be very small. So I would like to know from Durba about his experience on this. Uh, thank you for asking me such a question because we are, our organization is working on that. Uh, we are working on, uh, with an organization, with an Omen SAG uh, Federation, a group of SAGs. So, uh, we, uh, our target is to provide livelihood for the SAG group members and as well as for the other uh, villagers uh, to, to provide them with uh, livelihood options like alternate or that uh, usual livelihoods they have. We support them to do that. And uh, our object uh, which we want is to Engage everyone, engage everyone, and uh, in in the conservation also. Like you know, now everyone wants to earn something or to make their own uh, living. But everyone, everyone from the village. I'm talking about the villages. But everyone is not into conservation. They, uh, the, our objective is to take advantage of some government programs. Like we are working with SAGs, and uh, we have. Uh, uh, good government support from the, the government pro programs like National Rural Livelihood Mission, which is supporting the um, our Indian government, which is supporting the grass, uh, the SAG groups to take up livelihood options, and some other uh, uh, national programs like MG and Rega, which are uh, we are also working to collaborate with the Panchayati Raj uh, system uh, and to generate livelihood, which can also uh, help to conserve uh, natural resources like 
soil and water. So these are the two programs which we are trying to take adva advantage. And uh, now, currently, we are working in 10 villages in our area. And our aim is to provide livelihood for everyone uh, in those villages and engage them in conservation work, non in, uh, not into the, that uh, you know species conservation. Like you know, not a particular. We are not talking about conservation of a particular species. We are talking conservation as a whole. So we we are trying to do that, and we hope we'll be successful linking those uh, and taking the advantage of such uh, huge uh, government programs to make people aware and to take advantage of the. Uh, government programs to do better conservation in our uh, village setup. So that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Can I just quickly add? Yes. Uh, it's, it's really very nice and interesting to see how the government is working in, yes. in terms of all these models that Dhuba has just mentioned. But one thing that is there which comes from the field is the point of inclusion. How many people are included in this process? For instance, I'll quickly give an example of an eco task force which worked in uh, one of the fringe villages of Namiri <coughs> National Park. So it's in a village called Torazan. And uh, the people complain the, what they have done, this eco task force, they have come and they have um, cleared a patch of land where the villagers earlier used to have mustard plantation. So m mustard used to be a cash crop. And they used to generate a lot of money as a supplement to the agriculture. But now what the uh, Eco Task Force has done, they have, in the name of um, providing non-timber forest products to the people, they have replaced the mustard cultivation with afforestation. So the people from the uh, Eco Task Force complain that the people do not cooperate from the village. And the villagers complain that they have taken a source of their livelihood. So their Somewhere there is a conflict between the state <coughs> policy and what people actually think of their life. Thank you. The question is to me. No, no, no. It just, it's just, it's I just added something. Like, where is the problem? May I just make one quick intervention, uh, just as a suggestion? Uh, and I guess also because I'm probably one of the few corporate people in the room, I think there is a there is an opportunity for this, uh, for, for the conservation world to also engage uh, with, with companies, not only from asking them to write a check, which they will do very reluctantly, I can assure you, uh, but the fact that they understand some of the things that are very important for libraries. They understand what is marketing, they understand efficiencies, and so on and so forth. And you'll have, uh, uh, you know, uh, companies like the group I was, the Tata Group, which has actually a very robust volunteering program where we actually enable our, our people who are marketing folks or production folks to actually go and volunteer with NGOs over periods of time. So I think there is an opportunity there to actually use the skills that corporates have, not just the money that they have, to actually see how we can take livelihoods to the next level and, and, conserve, and, and promote conservation. I would actually like to build on that and take it a step further. Um, you know, I'm thinking also of the, the startup economy. You see a lot of new venture capital firms that uh, position themselves as social impact venture capitalists. And, uh, but you see that most of this social impact venture capital is actually going to urban areas it's not reaching the rural areas at all. So we need to also ask ourselves, what do we need to do to make sure that this available capital can actually reach the rural areas? Because from what I've heard and you know, I've spoken to some friends and family who are in the venture capital business, and their answer to that is, oh, it's really difficult for us to go in a rural area and find these uh, startups. So maybe what we need to be also looking at is giving them, uh, you know, the people in the rural areas, these making these connections, uh, you know, actually bringing them and saying, okay, no, look, you know, we know of this startup. This is really good. I think you should go check this out. And I think that could also be another potential source of both revenue and encouragement uh, for rural. Uh, development through uh, alternative livelihoods. Uh, 
Um, I think uh, with this, uh, because of the time factor, we need to close the discussion here. Uh, but before we, Dr. Zhu wraps up, I think we have time for maybe two questions from the audience to the panelists, to any one of them. We have, I'm sorry, just time for two questions. Varun. So I think, particularly uh, from uh, the discussion that was going on about how the two worlds, the world of conservation and the world of livelihood, is coming. So I think at one stage there is this whole issue of whether there is this conflict between conservation and development and that can come in. Uh, but I see a great opportunity, and, and I think importantly so, is that even as a conservation NGO, when we engage with livelihood issues, uh, many times there are so many different kinds of livelihoods that are tried by various institutions, whether they are livelihood organizations working through it, with an interest for conservation or conservation NGOs working with livelihood as part of their you know, uh, strategy. And uh, what I see, and this is perhaps my experience, but what I see is that many times there isn't this clear link as to how those livelihoods are going to, you know, can loop back to contribute towards conservation. So I think that greater dialogue between the livelihood groups and the conservation groups and thinking about this more deeply uh, will benefit both from a livelihood perspective but also bring in actually you know some kind of measurable conservation benefits that we hope to Very good. Can I so make a quick comment on that? I, do not like to talk. I, yeah. I think actually you don't even need the dialogue. We both to somehow get the, the, the feeling out there that you can't do one without the other. You can't do livelihood because you're not helping anybody's livelihood if you're not looking at conservation issues you know, at the same time. And you certainly can't do any con successful conservation projects if you're not looking at that subject. So, yeah. Yeah, very good. Do we have additional comments in the column panel? Yeah, one please. more. Yeah. I'm from Botanical Survey in Jesse Lowell. So I just wanted to know because we are talking about so what the what measure are you taking for conservation? <coughs> the presentation which I I observed in the morning is on agriculture and other things. But when we talk conservation, it is the natural resources. So especially plants, animals, what type of you are, you are advocating for conservation? Because I don't see any of that. <coughs> Anyone like to comment or comment? Yeah, I can add to that. Um, so yeah, moving away from the topic of sustainable agriculture and sustainable land use to actual conservation, it, it comes from sort of a, a ground up approach of giving value to the landscape in which you are living, in which you are harvesting and working. And one of the best examples is uh, in Western Yunnan, the a community of, of, of villagers from, a, from the area have come together and of their own initiative they auction off sections of forest for the wild harvesting of mushrooms and the auction value of that forest is based on the quality of that forest so the locals have come to understand that a well maintained healthy forest has more value in terms of the products you can get from that forest and it, it's an incentive, like a true incentive, to look after your landscape, knowing that you can benefit from it. Yeah. And uh, very, very good comments, because of time strain and uh, a constraint, I know I like to wrap up a day session. <coughs> so thanks to audience, thanks to our panel, and uh, thanks to also speed talker uh, this morning. Uh, I'd like to say, 20 years ago, and uh, I work with uh, my close friend from India, Sela Wardro, I don't know whether they're still working for WWF India. And uh, we have a program called Integrate Conservation and the Development Program. So based in Bangkok, and we look at the regional approach and the landscape, local attitudes. You know, we try to really link integration between conservation and the development. I think uh, still the concept is a value, still value today. Uh, but, so I like to say, the so integration will start with the sh shared vision and mission by starting single target and for one year, for five years, for the next decade, and what we're going to achieve. To buy added more value to tree through the digging out the mushroom or name the new 
source of income from forest. So I think we still haven't done enough, still a long way to go to understand the integrated part of conservation and the livelihoods. So sharing the vision and the mission and the target as a first step. The second also, business as usual is not an option anymore because we're living in a changing world, new economy, new platform. So we need a core production new knowledge system by introducing new technology for seedling, marketing, etc. I think we do need a core production of new knowledge, I call hybrid knowledge. So it's not the local knowledge, not the scientific knowledge, it's the knowledge shared, co-produced by all stakeholders who in, involve this process. The third one, I think, uh, keep up the process is very important. We cannot achieve our goal, our mission was one day. It's a long-term process. Core design a first step to certain small innovation to gain confidence and that they move to the next stage through the long-term experiment. So we have long-term uh, monitoring. Also, we have uh, also the uh, you know we work with Missouri Botanic Garden about phenology, and uh, so everyone can participate in phenology, understand climate change. The local phenology, the fruit blooming, harvest, how year around are called ecological calendar. And uh, that way, you know, through the core design innovation, which allowed everyone to participate. The fourth, very important, sharing the cost, benefit. I really uh, like that uh, our, our panel talk about uh, the responsibility of uh, everyone, so not uh, the private sector just gives the money, sign the check, but also they look at the contract, how to bring products from farmer to the market, the local, the local and the global market value chain. So sharing, that's also the risk. We might get pregnant, you know, the certain products might not always go to the market or best, get the best return. So the sharing risk cost, benefit, and also responsibility are very important from different uh, stakeholders. Finally, I'd like to say, in today's world, we need a new intuition, a new relationship. So it's a cross scale. I just, so we're not only need a scaling up, but also scaling out to reach certain uh, people who understand, try to convince them to understand the integration part of conservation development. So today are different from yesterday, and our future and can be certain by today's action. So tomorrow, our better future depends today on a new way of thinking, new way of establishing relationship. So in this regard, I'd like to close our session. Uh, thanks to our speaker, our uh, panel, and also our audience.